Okay, welcome everyone to this Map Time Davis session. Today we are talking about QGIS. We're going to do an intro to GIS with uh, QGIS. My name is Michelle Tobias. I am the Geospatial Data Specialist at UC Davis Data Lab, and I am your speaker today, so I'm introducing myself. Um, I really like this workshop. QGIS is one of my favorite things on the planet. It's a super cool program. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, I'm going to put some links in the chat for you. A uh, couple things that I think are going to be helpful in general. Um, a whole bunch of links coming your way in the chat. Um, the first one is our schedule for um, Map Time Davis for the rest of the quarter. We've got, um, I think, just one more workshop coming up on drones. Um, so if you scroll down on that page, you'll see kind of in the middle of the page is our, our list of topics. Um, and so uh, the drone workshop should be pretty cool. Um, we had to reschedule that from last quarter. So um, if you missed it, you didn't miss it, we're gonna do it now <laughs> for next week. Um, also, if you scroll down on that page, there is a link to the application for uh, Map Time Davis Council. Uh, applications to join Map Time Davis Council are due on Friday. So if you would like to be a part of the organizing body that makes Map Time Davis happen, that is how you apply. So it's a one year commitment. Um, it's really just a couple hours a week uh, doing the organizing and then attending workshops as as you can. Um, you don't necessarily need to attend all of them, but you know the ones that you can attend are great, um, and that's how we actually make Map Time Davis happen right now. Um, you know, not only do you participate as attendees, but you can participate in helping us organize and supporting uh, the things that need to go on behind the scenes. Like um, right now, you don't know it, but somebody is manning the participants list, and someone else is doing the attendance forms because we have to keep stats and stuff like that. Um, and then also the ideas for the workshops and things like that come from Map Time Davis Council and you guys, but um, largely Map Time Davis Council is making all of this happen. So if you would like to help um, build up our community, um, especially as we transition back to some in-person stuff, probably uh, next school year, we could really use more um, hands on deck as it were. So um, feel free to apply for that. You can also send me questions or any of the council members questions about that if you have them. Um, I also put a link to our YouTube channel in the meeting chat so you can see that um, we're going to get things posted as I get the time to do that. Uh, and then the other resources down at the bottom of that list are um, some mental health resources and um, some other uh, things for the UC Davis community. Um, I know we've been through a lot in the last couple weeks, um, and it would be completely reasonable to reach out to, for help um, with some mental health resources. So put some links there um, and feel free to use those or any other resources you come across. Um, just want to recognize that it's been a challenging couple weeks. Okay, so that's sort of our beginning stuff. Um, for those of you who might be new to Map Time Davis, we are a community um, based in Davis, California at UC Davis, um, supported largely by UC Davis Data Lab, um, which is a unit within the UC Davis Library. And we focus on teaching people uh, spatial science skills. Um, we like location data and we like learning how to use that and the tools to help us work with that kind of data. And so that's really our focus. There are other map time chapters throughout the world that kind of have different flavors, but that ours is mostly focused on research skills and things like that. Um, so that's who we are and what we're doing. Um, so today, like I said, we are going to be learning about uh, GIS in general and QGIS specifically. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, share my screen. Let me also give you the link to the workshop materials. So the link I'm putting in the chat right now is the link to our written materials for the workshop. Um, you can feel free to follow along there um, as we go along if you miss something um, or if you need, there, there'll be some points in the workshop where I'm going to rattle off numbers and um, that will give you the numbers so you don't have to like furiously write stuff down. You can refer to the, the workshop materials and it's all spelled out there for you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and so this is our workshop materials for today. This is going to be kind of a little bit 
hard to do on this screen, but we will bear with it. Um, and again, so if this is hard to read, feel free to refer to the link I put in the chat um, so that you can follow along maybe on a different screen. Um, also, I'll mention that sometimes it's really hard to do these kind of workshops on Zoom and try to navigate paying attention to what I am saying in the demo and then trying to do it on your own and switching back and forth between screens. Or if you only have one screen, it can be really challenging. If it feels overwhelming, please just watch. Um, you can always come back to the workshop materials later. Um, you are not tested. I'm not gonna give you a grade at the end of this. So if you just wanna sit and watch, that's perfectly fine. If you wanna follow along, that's great too. Um, whatever makes you happy or whatever is gonna be the best way for you to learn. Um, so today we are working on learning about geographic information systems or GIS. Um, we are gonna specifically be using the QGIS platform today. Um, the prereqs for this workshop are pretty much, I'm going to assume that you know how to work your personal computer that you are currently watching the Zoom session on, um, and that you can download files and you can move stuff around on your computer, um, and that you, if you're following along with us, that you have installed QGIS um, and you can do those kinds of things. Um, I'm not going to assume you have previous knowledge of GIS in general. This is intended for beginners. Um, it's also intended for folks who've been working with other uh, graphical GIS tools, or maybe they've been working in a programming language and they want to learn uh, how QGIS, QGIS works specifically. So um, if you're a complete beginner, great. Um, you just have exactly what you need, which is pretty much no previous knowledge. And if you do have previous knowledge, you will learn a lot as well about the specifics of, of QGIS. So our learning objectives, um, I'm not going to read all of this to you because you can read it yourself, but essentially our plan today is to get a good foundation of what are the data types, the um, data formats um, that you're going to most likely encounter as you start on your GIS journey. Um, we're going to learn some terminology. My goal with intro workshops is always to get you enough language that you can be really good at Googling stuff. Because um, if you don't have a language, you can't learn, you can't search for things. Um, but if we can get you the basic language, then you can start learning on your own. So that's my main objective here is to get you enough terminology that you can understand. You can effectively search for the things you need and you can understand the answers. So you can learn on your own. Um, so we're also going to learn about, um, we're going to learn how to add data. We're going to learn how to do um, work with attributes with our data. We're going to do some basic queries and symbolization. And then we're also going to learn how to make a map. Um, so there's a lot to cover today, um, but we'll get through most of it. There will be a section that we probably won't have time to cover. And then you can do that on your own. But by the end of two hours, you're going to be ready for a break anyway. So it's it's all good. It's good to have too much on in the materials and instead of not filling the time. Okay, so you can refer back to this later. I'll put the link to today's video um, once we finish it here as well. But if you wanted to come back and watch older versions of this workshop, they're listed here. Um, this workshop has been taught quite a bit, <laughs> as you can see. Um, so if you wanted for some reason to watch an older version, you could. Okay, so that's sort of the intro situating your uh, expectations kind of stuff. Um, next up, what I want to do is start jumping into some of the materials for today. And again, as we go along, if you have questions, please put your questions in the Zoom meeting chat, and then my helpers will keep an eye on that and they'll let me know if there's something I need to address. So, um, or if you're having any trouble, you can post there and the helpers can help sort out some of that stuff. Okay, so what is GIS? You're here for a GIS workshop, but if you're new, you might be thinking like, I've heard of this before, but what is this? Um, so at the very basic level, uh, GIS is an acronym. It can stand for a couple of things. Um, the two most common ones that you see are, um, it can stand for geographic information system. Um, and when we talk about the system part of this, we are talking about um, the tools that and the software that we use to create spatial data and to investigate spatial relationships between that data. So a lot of things can be a GIS in that sense. Um, it's pretty it's a pretty broad definition. Um, but also we refer to GIS, it can also stand for geographic information science. And in that case, that's the framework that we're using to ask the questions about the spatial relationships between the data. So um, 
you generally won't hear people make a distinction about the difference between these two versions of the acronym. Um, it's a fairly academic concept, but occasionally you will hear it. So I mentioned this here. So, you know, system refers to the tools, the software, and the science is sort of the process that we use um, with those. So they, they definitely are integrated together. But just so you know, you may hear both of those occasionally. Um, All right, so um, so now we've we've talked about what is GIS, and then you might ask yourself, okay, what is QGIS? Um, so QGIS is a specific software package. Um, it's a tool that you can download um, from the QGIS website. Um, their description of their tool is that QGIS is a user-friendly open source geographic information system licensed under the new general public license. QGIS is QGIS is an official project of the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. Uh, it runs on Linux, Unix, Mac, Windows, and Android, uh, and supports a number, it supports numerous vector, raster, and database formats and functionalities. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. Um, all of that is true, but some of it might not be so clear. Um, so let's start with some of these uh, things that that description covers. So. QGIS is a desktop GIS. So what that means is we have a program that you can run on your computer that uh, operates in the form of windows and interactive visual displays that you can click on and uh, fill out forms and things like that. Um, this kind of tool is often referred to as a graphical user interface um, or GUI, but mostly people pronounce this GUI, um, which I find completely charming. Um, so you'll, you're more likely to hear someone call it a GUI, like a desktop GIS GUI. Um, so there's that. Um, basically what this means is that you don't have to do programming. It's a window type environment where there's forms you can fill out and things you can click on and, and things like that. Navigation through um, a you know, window based system to your files and things like that. Okay, so we're not necessarily going to need to do any programming. In fact, today we're not. Um, you can, but that's outside the scope of this particular workshop. Okay, so the next part of this is that QGIS is open source. Um, what that means is that we have access to the underlying code and we can read it and we can modify it if we choose to, but we don't have to. Um, the big advantage to this is that if something isn't working the way we expect it to, we can make fixes on our own or we can get someone else to help us with fixes if we need things fixed. It also means we can add new features if we wanted to. Again, this is outside of the scope of today, um, but just be aware that that's one of the advantages of open source is you can tell what's going on in the code. Um, it's not a closed system. So this is particularly advantageous for researchers who um, are interested in reproducibility. We can know exactly what our algorithms and tools are doing because we can actually look at the underlying code, um, which is not the case with um, other forms of software that are proprietary or closed source, um, where we can put data in and every time we run a thing, we get different output and we don't know why. Um, that may actually be what we want, but in QGIS, um, we can find out why because we can actually look at the underlying code and, and understand what's going on. And then the final part of this is um, in that description that uh, QGIS is a project, it's an official project of OSGEO. I just want to mention that OSGEO is a uh, international nonprofit that works to um, foster the adoption of geospatial technology. And basically, it helps the open source ecosystem function. It supports projects like QGIS and also um, important things like libraries that um, help pretty much every geospatial tool out there. Things like uh, GDAL and the Proj library um, are two things that a lot of resources rely on. And those are all also projects of OSGO. So um, it's a cool organization if you're interested um, in learning more about that. There's a link in the workshop materials. Um, it's also a really great community. Um, they put on workshops and um, code sprints and conferences. There's actually two conferences coming up. Um, there's an international one in Kosovo coming up at the end of June. And then in um, October, we have the um, North America Phosphor G conference that's going to happen in Baltimore. Um, so um, 
look up those or ask me for links. You can email me if you can't find it. I'll be happy to give you a link. I'm actually helping organize the, the one in Baltimore in October. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so um, now you might be asking yourself, um, why QGIS? <laughs> so <laughs> we've kind of learned a little bit about what it is. What are the advantages of using QGIS over the large number of other programs that are out there? Um, a lot of people are familiar with uh, things like ArcGIS or ArcGIS Pro, ArcMap, things like that. But there's a lot of other actual graphical user interface GIS uh, systems out there, including things like GVSIG. So why do we want to use QGIS versus some of these other tools? Um, you have a lot of choices. So um, I've been working with QGIS for a long time uh, since I think I think I first downloaded it in 2007, um, 2008, somewhere in there. Um, I like it because it is, at this point, it is a robust, powerful desktop GIS. Um, one of the other things that makes my life at Data Lab easier as somebody who recommends different tools for people to use is that it runs on all the major uh, platforms for computing. So uh, Mac, Linux, and Windows um, is supported. So um, if you have a Mac, you can do GIS here without having to deal with, um, you know, booting into different systems. Just makes life a little bit easier. It's free of charge. You can't beat that. Um, there is, you don't need to pay to play in any way, shape, or form. Um, there are frequent bug updates and fixes. Um, so if something is not working, the community jumps on it, gets fixed really quick. So you don't have to wait for yearly updates or quarterly updates even. If there's something big going on, a new release will come out um, pretty quickly. So um, it's also a really responsive and enthusiastic community. Um, there's folks on pretty much every social media platform who will um, probably help if you have questions. I know I'm on Twitter quite a bit and it's um, there's a lot of QGIS folks there that when I have questions, I get answers really fast. Um, it also integrates nicely with other tools you might be using like programming languages like R and Python and also uh, tools like PostGIS, which is the spatial extension for uh, Postgres. So if you need uh, database functionality, it plugs in with QGIS super nice. So um, you just need to, um, you can have all your data in PostGIS, for example, and then connect it to QGIS, and then you can view all your data sets there. You don't have to make uh, saved outputs and things like that. You can just plug them together, and then you can visualize your um, database data, and it is wonderful. Um, it's really helpful, especially if you need password protected data for those of you in like the um, like health field or um, anytime you have like personal like information like addresses and stuff like that. You need it password protected. You can put it in PostGIS and then your data can be password protected and safe. Um, you can also connect QGIS with other tools like Grass and Saga, um, which is nice because then you can just have it all in one place in the interface you're familiar with. Um, it also works with uh, open formats natively. It comes in 40 different languages, possibly more. Um, which is really nice if you're collaborating with folks who whose first language is not English. Um, or if you're collaborating internationally, everyone can use the same tool um, and use it in language that they're most comfortable in, which is really nice. And also um, QGIS and a lot of open source tools are actually growing in use in local, state, federal, and international governments. Um, our state actually has a mandate to um, look at open source tools, and we're seeing that growing in the state and federal government communities. I actually just like a month ago taught a workshop to the um, interagency ecological program um, at their workshop. Um, their big meeting for the year um, and a lot of state and federal folks attended that um, because it just it's something that they need to learn so um, QGIS is growing in use in a lot of places so if you were wondering why you're here <laughs> there's some really good reasons um, and so what I want to do now is pause and just see if there are any questions about any of the stuff we've just talked about feel free to throw questions in the chat You don't have to have questions, but if you do, now is a good time. All right. Not seeing anything pop up, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in there, and my uh, team of helpers uh, will let me know if there's something I need to address. 
Okay, so we are going to, I promise after this, um, we've got one more section of concepts and then we're going to jump into the hands on stuff. So um, if you're yawning, uh, snap back to reality. Let's, <laughs> um, this is really, the next thing is really important in terms of understanding today's hands on material. So um, data types. There are two data types that you are likely to encounter most frequently. These are not the only data types that you will encounter but um, they are the most common ones. Um, and those are raster data and vector data. So I have this handy dandy diagram here to help you understand and visualize the difference between these. So we're going to start with vector data. Vector data is, um, you can think of it as generally being represented by uh, three different shapes. You can have points, you can have lines, and you can have polygons. And uh, these different shapes are useful for representing different kinds of things. Um, and vector data in general is really helpful for representing uh, discrete objects. So I like to think of vector data uh, as the sort of our human default. Um, I imagine if, let's say we were going to, um, you're going to meet up with some friends for lunch um, and tell them about this wonderful workshop you had attended. Um, so you're going to go to lunch with your friends. You're going to meet up at, let's let's say you're going to meet at Crateville in Davis. Um, you might need to draw them a map of how to get there. Um, let's say they broke their phone or their phone's out of battery and they can't use their usual turn-by-turn -turn directions, but you're like, it's cool. I'll draw you a map. So you get out a piece of paper and you start drawing. Drawing. Chances are the map you draw to get to Crateville from your office on campus is vector data. You're going to draw points, lines, and polygons. So for the roads, you're going to draw lines. Um, for um, if you were, I like to use Crateville as an example because perhaps you're going to draw Central Park on that map. And you probably, because Central Park's a big area, um, in Davis, you're going to draw a polygon. You're going to draw a big rectangle and you're going to write Central Park in the middle of it so that they know um, that that's one of the landmarks you want them to see as they're walking down uh, Third Street. And then across the street from the park, you might put a point, like you might make a little circle or you might make a star because that's where Crapeville is and you need them to know that it's across the street from the park, it's not on the same side of the street. Um, so right there, you've just drawn points, lines and polygons uh, to make your map to tell your friend how to get to your meeting spot for lunch. So I think um, a lot of times vector data is a little bit more intuitive just because it is represents discrete objects. Um, but we can also use vector data to represent continuous data. Um, we just have to kind of make it discrete. So um, a good example of continuous data uh, being represented as a vector are things like topo lines. So if you've ever looked at a topo map and you've seen the elevation lines like on a USGS topo, for example, um, that, that's an example of continuous data. Elevation could be any number, right? It could be one, it could be 1.1, it could be 1.11, um, and on and on and on. Um, but to make it into something that's vector data, we have to turn it into lines of equal elevation. So um, for example, maybe this middle line here is uh, five meters and this darker line here is six meters and then seven meters on this other like even darker line. And then we know we can interpolate with our brains in between, uh, you know, elevation six and seven, that somewhere in here is probably around 6.5, kind of in between these two lines. Um, so we've taken that continuous data, we've turned it into a discrete object, in this case, a line, um, and now we've made vector data. So this works fairly well, especially if you, um, well, there's a lot of reasons why that you'd want to have this kind of data, but we won't get into too much of that. Um, the other type of data, so that was vector data. The other type of data that you will see quite a bit in your GIS journey is something called raster data. And raster data, this format takes the world and it breaks it into pixels. So everything turns into a grid. And within each of those grid cells, we have a value. Um, so you work with raster data probably every day. Every time you take a picture with your phone, you actually make raster data. And if you zoom in a lot on those pictures that you're taking with your phone, you'll actually see pixels, right? Like the little squares and they're each individually colored. Um, that color actually comes from underneath. You actually have three raster layers and one contains the information for the red value, the blue value and the green value that is gonna be displayed and mixed together. Um, but we can use raster data 
um, to represent discrete objects. Um, I have turned our uh, vector data here into raster data to give you an example of what that looks like. Um, basically, we turn everything into pixels and then label the pixels with the category that they are. So maybe this is the park, that's the road, and these are the restaurants. Um, more commonly, um, you will see raster data used with categorical data like this for things like land cover. Uh, it's a really effective way to do things like land cover or crop cover um, because it um, is uh, makes for smaller files when you're talking about things like, um, you know, like national land cover, or national crop cover. Um, these data sets in raster format are going to be smaller than vector data sets. So um, there's really good reasons why you would use raster with discrete data. Raster, however, is really good at representing continuous data um, because in each of these cells, we can put any number. So we can actually say like this uh, cell here in the corner isn't um, one, it's 1.1, 1 .1, and this one's 1 1.2, and this one's 1.3. 1 um, it can take on any value. In order to display it, we're going to have to categorize it a little bit, um, or we could actually apply a continuous ramp to it as well. Um, but for display purposes here, and because I had to do this by hand in Inkscape, it had to be kind of chunked up into categories. But you get the idea. Raster is really good for um, continuous data and being able to, to store any number. We don't have to um, make a decision up front. We can store all of the data that way. OK, we could spend an entire workshop on the pluses and minuses of raster versus vector or the other data formats that are out there, like point clouds and all kinds of different stuff. But um, this is all you need to know for now to get started. Um, the difference between raster and vector data comes up quite a bit. And I think understanding these two formats is a good starting point that you can build on when you think about other other data sets, because like point clouds are essentially point data with some special properties, for example. So um, all right, so all of this text about raster and vector data I talked about, you can refer to that again in the workshop materials if you'd like. All right. OK, so that was the concept. So we talked about what is a GIS. We talked about what is QGIS. And we talked about the two data types that you're most likely to encounter. Um, the next thing we're going to do is download some data. Um, if you haven't downloaded it yet, um, there's a link here in chapter six of our workshop material. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to hold down control and then click on my keyboard to open this in a new tab so I can show you what this looks like. This is going to open a box drive. Um, and box may give you a little warning thing that's like, hey, you should log in or set up an account. Ignore it. You don't need to log in. Um, you also don't need to download all of these files individually. There's this handy button up here in the right hand upper corner of your window that is for downloading. So it just looks like this arrow pointing at a uh, horizontal line. And if you click on that, it is going to open up a download um, interface and it's going to uh, ask you where you want to save it. It might take a second. It's kind of uh, slow. I'm not sure why it takes a minute, but it does. Um, I've already downloaded it, so I'm not going to download it again. I am going to move this over on the side, though. Um, so again, don't download these individually. We've got shapefiles in here, and shapefiles are their own special thing that has a lot of pieces. But you do use this download button in the upper right-hand corner to get all of the data at once. It's going to download a zip. Put the zip somewhere you can find it on your file system. Then go find it and unzip it. Um, so you're definitely going to want these files unzipped to work with today um, because we are going to do some saving. I think QGIS will open things in zip files, but um, it's better practice to unzip it um, and have that ready to go that way. Um, so while you're doing that, um, there is, um, so I see there's a question about where to find data. Um, if you're from UC Davis, come see me in office hours um, for Data Lab. Uh, if not, maybe one of the helpers can help with that. Um, Today is not for uh, general GIS help, but I'm happy to help people in office hours um, as needed. Um, so today, our data that you're downloading right now, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. Um, so we've got a digital elevation model of the city of San Francisco. Um, this is raster data. So our data inside of our pixels is elevations. 
Um, the other data sets we have are streets, which is a vector data set uh, of basically lines that represent streets. We have a trees data set that's vector data, it's point data, but it's going to come in CSV format. It's really common to get point data in CSV format. Um, you will have, uh, the more you do this, you'll have a love-hate relationship with CSV data <laughs> for GIS. Um, if, if Excel touches it, it can be a disaster. Um, but then also we've got seismic hazard zones. Those are polygons. Um, and the city of San Francisco's boundary is also a polygon. So we've got points, lines, and polygons. We've also got raster data. And again, that's all living in this box folder online. Um, so tell you what, why don't you, in your, um, in your reaction uh, menu on Zoom, uh, give me a, some indication if you've got your uh, data and you're ready to go. If you're just watching today, um, give me a you know green thumbs up that you're ready to go to, um, just so I can know if, if folks really want a minute to finish downloading or if you're like yeah let's let's jump into the hands-on stuff and the QGIS part of this. Okay. I've asked you to do that and now Zoom is not showing it to me whatsoever. Oh there we go. There's my list. Thank you, Zoom. All right, so I'm seeing a couple of checks and thumbs up. Um, if it erased while I was looking for that, go ahead and, and reactivate your reaction. If anyone needs another minute and they're like, hold on, I've got questions, I'm having trouble downloading, give me some indication, either a thumbs down or a red X or sad face or something like that um, in your reactions toolbar so I can give you a minute. Okay, I'm not seeing an... Uh, uh, Michelle? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Wanted yep. to know, like, you're asking if we have like the data, like that's pretty much been downloaded already, and mm -hmm. if we have QGIS pulled up, that's just the question, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm just making sure that everybody has um, that wants to download the data has had a chance to do that. Cool. All right. I'm not seeing anybody saying, "Hold on, wait." So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, for folks who are still downloading it. Um, I'm going to give a little intro, um, so uh, you'll have time to catch up as as we do that. Okay, so what's going to happen now is I only have one screen for sharing, so I'm going to bring QGIS up on the screen that you're going to be seeing. I am still going to be using the same workshop material in the background. I have it printed, um, so I can look at all of the stuff at once, but just so you know, if you're following along, I'm still going to be working through the same materials that you've been looking at this whole time. I'm just not going to put it on the screen and flash back and forth because that's going to make everybody dizzy. Um, but just so you know where we're at. So see, I promise I have the printed version right here. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we have, uh, so we've downloaded our data. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to start QGIS. And I've got mine started already just because I need a specific profile that doesn't have all of my research stuff loaded for you. Um, this is going to look more like what yours will look like. Um, you can see uh, that Zoom and QGIS don't like each other. So it's going to take it a minute to get with the program. Um, but you can start uh, QGIS the way you would start any program you normally would on your computer. So if you're on Windows, you can hit the Windows button and search for QGIS. Or if you're on Mac, you can start QGIS the way you would start, you know, any any normal program searching for it. Or if there's a menu or something like that, you can pick it from. Um, so it probably would have been quicker if I'd started it from scratch. But since I started Zoom, it's going to be cranky. Um, I promise yours may be a little bit cranky, too, because you're running Zoom while we're doing this, if you're trying to follow along. Um, QGIS runs a lot more smoothly without Zoom running because they're competing for resources, but normally QGIS is pretty stable. Um, so I'm just going to maximize this so you can see um, what I'm doing here. Um, okay, so it's remembering that I taught this workshop last month and I didn't clear this out, but your when you start up QGIS, yours will look somewhat similar. Um, there's typically somewhere on the screen, there's a news pane where they'll tell you any information about you know, upcoming things like sometimes they'll announce conferences, sometimes they'll announce uh, new long term releases, things like that. Um, it's also telling me down at the bottom that there's a, yet another new version of QGIS. Um, I'm 
on 3.30, but it looks like there's a, a sub-release available as well. I'm not going to worry about that right now. They're all really similar. Um, you'll also have um, a list of recent projects and potentially templates. Um, if you haven't worked with QGIS before, your recent project list is empty. And normally, um, mine is two for this profile. But like I said, it's remembering I taught this workshop last month and I didn't clear this out. OK, so the way we're going to start a new uh, project is there's a couple ways. You can either find this icon up here. Um, it's typically up in the left-hand corner, but um, these toolbars can move around. Um, so I'll show you also, you can start it from the project menu and click on new in, in the project menu. Um, you can see my menus are a little smashy because I made the, the font too big for the screen, but that's okay. I think we'll still be able to read that well enough. Okay, so we started our new project. And again, the easy way is once you start QGIS, go from go to the project menu and click new, um, either on the home screen or you could do it again, but you'll just get a new project once you've started it. Um, okay, so I have a new project. It's a big blank screen. Um, a little tour of the interface before we get going. Um, this big space in the middle is where our data will be visualized for us. And we'll see that in a second. Um, we over here on the left side, we have this browser panel. We can navigate to our data this way. So if yours has different drives than mine, that's normal. That's because um, we may have different drives <laughs> and it's personalized to your computer. Then we also have this layers panel and this is where a list of data is going to go. So when we've loaded data, we'll see a list of data here and there's menu options and things like that associated with it. Up here at the top, we have a whole bunch of space and yours may look slightly different depending on what you have loaded. Um, this, these are all of our tools on our toolbar. Um, we also can get to tools through our menus up here at the top as well. Um, so there is a lot, a lot of things going on in QGIS. We're just going to scratch the surface today, but let's go ahead and um, jump into loading some data. Okay, so um, the way we load data is there's a the same tool, you can just get to it a couple different ways. Um, I see my QGIS is going to be extra cranky with Zoom for us. Um, so one way is to find this button here that looks like, it looks like three, to me, it looks like three index cards. There's a red, a yellow, and a blue one, and this little plus button. Um, you can open it. It's called the Open Source or Open Data Source Manager. That's <laughs> a long title. Um, another way, the easier way to find it in terms of workshops is to go to the Layers menu up at the top and pick this first option, Data Source Manager. So again, go to the Layers menu um, and then pick Data Source Manager at the top of the list. But also, if you see that icon on your toolbar, it opens the same thing. Uh, it's just easier since the toolbars can move around if I show you where it is on the, the menus. OK, so Layer Menu, Data Source Manager. I'm going to click there. And it is going to open my Data Source Manager. Now, yours may be on a different tab. Um, what matters is look on the left-hand side of this um, window that pops up. I think mine is fully expanded. Um, so uh, right now, mine is defaulting to delimited text. Just moved for me. Let me just make this a little smaller so that it fits in the window. Um, OK. so. But what I want to load first is raster data. So I'm going to click over here on the left hand side panel on raster. And this is why I needed you to needed you to know the difference between raster and vector data, because how you load data in QGIS matters based on what type of data you're loading. Um, so now you kind of have a preview of all the different things that can load. What we really care about right now is raster data, because that's what we're going to load first. OK, so what we want to do is um, click on our browse button for a raster data set. If you knew the path to your data, you could type it in or you could copy and paste it. But I'm going to browse. So I'm going to use this button that has the three dots, the ellipsis marks. I'm going to click on that and it's going to open up my file browser. Um, and what I need to do is navigate to where I saved my data. Um, and in this case, I have it in my workshop data. This is why I need you to save your data where you can find it because you're going to have to navigate to it. So I put my data in this folder. Um, you should find it in your file system where you put it. And I'm going to look for um, our DEM underscore SF dot TIFF file. You'll notice that there's also a similarly named file that um, is dot TIFF dot 
.ox.xml. Um, that's an auxiliary file. We don't need to tell QGIS about it. It will find it if it needs it because it has the same name. So all I need to do is click on the file dem underscore sf .tiff, and then click the open button. What that's going to do is it's going to put the path to that data set in my um, uh, text field here. And then I'm going to look at my options. I'm going to leave the defaults. Um, you can read about um, in the help about what all of these do, but these should be fine left as is. So I'm just going to click the add button. And then I'm just going to move this. I'm dragging this window out of the way. You can leave it open or you can you could close it, but we're going to need it in a second. So um, it loaded my data. It doesn't quite look like the peninsula of San Francisco, which is right here, but it loaded something. So we'll work with the display of this later. Um, okay, so now we're going to um, load in our shape files, um, which are vector data. So I'm going to move my um, data source manager back into my general field of view. If you closed it, again, you can open it by um, going back to the uh, layer menu and selecting the data source manager. Um, I'm going to click on vector data here over on the left hand side. So I can load my vector data now. Okay, so we're going to load a couple things. Again, similar to the raster, I'm going to browse to my data sets with the ellipsis marks button. Um, now I'm going to load three different data sets, and I don't have to load them individually. I can actually select multiple data sets at once. Um, with my vector data, you'll notice, like, for example, my um, seismic hazard zone data set here, there's four different files with the same name that have different extensions. For QGIS, all I need to do is select the one that ends in .shp. That's sort of, I like to think of it as the ringleader of the shapefile. Um, shapefiles have multiple files that go together, but if I just tell QGIS I want the .shp part of that, it will find the other files, just like that auxiliary file for the TIFF. Um, we just need to indicate the .shp part of that. Okay, so I've selected my seismic hazard zones. I'm going to hold down control on my keyboard and select my shoreline.shp and then also my street centerlines.shp. So what that's going to do is it's going to load all three of these data sets at once so I don't have to load one and then find the next one and load that and you know blah 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 that could take forever. So I'm going to load all three of these at once. And then I am going to click open down here at the bottom. So again, holding down control on your keyboard and clicking will select multiple uh, .shp files um, as you click so that you can just load those all together. And so I'm going to click open down here at the bottom. And if you look through this um, string in this box here, you'll actually see that they're, um, the paths are all listed. They're just separated by, I think, with commas or um, semicolons. But um, generally, <laughs> we breeze past that and don't worry about it. Um, there's also options here. This can be really helpful um, for certain um, special cases, but our shape files are pretty standard. There's no reason to mess with this. I would mention the encoding part here. If you're working with a data set that has character encoding that's not um, standard like UTF-8, you could uh, indicate that there. Um, this is particularly useful if you're working um, with data sets that are in languages other than English um, or use a different character set, for example. Um, if things are not displaying correctly, you get a whole bunch of those little like black boxes in your attribute table. It's a character encoding issue, so you just need to figure out what your encoding is, and that's where you would put that. But for right now, these are all fine. It's not going to be an issue. So I'm going to click Add down here at the bottom, and it's going to ask me, oh no, these are in different projections than your project. Um, what transformation do you want to use? Um, the way you handle this interface is you look at um, what the name of the transformation is, it kind of gives you some information. And then you look at the accuracy column. And then you can also look at this next column, um, which is, I usually make it really big on my computer screen, on my, my larger screen, so I can read all of that. It will tell you where that um, transformation is designed for. Um, so you can pick one of these that's got um, you know reasonable accuracy. Um, for today, you can go ahead and just pick the first one. It's not going to matter for the workshop, but if you're working with research data, you might go through this list and be like, okay, you know, is this um, maybe I want to pick one for California. Like you can see, these ones are for Texas and Florida. There might be one in here for California or for the West Coast. Um, 
and that would be fine. But four meter accuracy for our purposes is fine. So I'm just going to pick the first one for this workshop. Um, so it's thinking about it. Um, it's not letting me move the window, so I think it's still loading. But what will happen is we will add our data sets that we just selected to our layers panel, and then they will show up in our um, main window as well. There we go. Uh, oops, now grab the map and dragging that around. Okay, so um, yours should look similar. Um, we've got we've got our street center lines, we've got our shoreline added, um, we've got our seismic hazard zone in our layers list. We also have our DEM. Um, they might be in a different order. Can't see them all right now on mine. Yours might be similar. We'll adjust that later. Oops, it closed my. Oh, there it is. Um, Sorry, again, with Zoom and also the smaller screen on my laptop, it's a little challenging. Okay, so the last thing we need to load is our CSV data. So this is where we're going to pick this delimited file type off of our menu on the left hand side. Um, this interface looks a little different than the other ones because there's a lot more options that we need to specify for this to be able to read properly. Um, the first option we need to pick is our file name. So again, clicking on the browse button, the three ellipsis marks, we're going to browse to our file that we want to load. Um, and mine is right now is set to um, down here at the bottom, um, it's only showing me text files. Um, it's limiting it, but if you wanted to look at all files, you could select that. Um, this is just handy because now I can easily find my CSV. So I'm going to select street street underscore tree underscore map dot CSV on my file list. And I'm going to click open. All right. So again, here we've got um, our encoding matters. Again, if it's not um, UTF-8 characters, if you have other things from other character sets, you're going to, want, going to want to pick the encoding that matches the encoding for your CSV. Um, if you're making this in Excel and you're using, um, you know, your English keyboard to put this in, it's probably UTF-8, but um, there are ways to find out what that is if it's not. Um, typically, you'll just see if you pick UTF-8 and it's wrong, then you'll get a bunch of weird characters you don't recognize, and that's a good indication you need to do some more exploring. Okay, so our file format in this case it is a CSV, so it's comma separated. You could have different delimiters, so you could have um, like a really good way to delimit files is using pipe. Um, that's the straight up and down stick character um, because nobody types with pipe usually, um, unless it's a um, unless you're making tables and like markdown. Um, so it's not something we typically use. So if you have like a free text column or something like that or description, commas can get confusing because we use those, you know, as a part of grammar. So um, using characters that are less likely to get used like pipe um, can be a really good way to delimit things. So we have a CSV today, it's comma separated, but you could have other delimiters, which you can, um, you can set with the custom delimiters or um, you can have an expression or things like that. Um, other things we want to look at um, for the records and fields option, our first record has field names, so that means we have column names in this data set. Sometimes you have that, sometimes you don't, so you pick the appropriate one. Um, there are other options we could pick. Um, I'm, I'm going to let it detect our field types. QGIS has gotten really good at that, um, so we'll just go ahead and let it do that. Um, but if you had something you needed to specify, you could change that. Um, you may need to expand the section for geometry definition. This is really important. We have point coordinates, and our X field is longitude, and our Y field is latitude. QGIS is really good at guessing this now um, based on names, but sometimes you end up with a data set that has multiple latitude and longitudes. Maybe they're in different projections. Maybe one's different, like, you know, decimal degrees versus degrees, minutes, seconds, stuff like that. So there's reasons you might want to specify this. Check and make sure you're using the right one. Our data set doesn't have Z, a Z field or an M field. Z is height. M is, um, I think, range along a network. Um, but if you had that, you could specify it. And then also importantly and really easy to miss is this part down here in the corner, um, this geometry CRS, so coordinate reference system. Um, what we want to do is I'm going to click on this button that looks like it's supposed to be like a little globe wearing a cone on top of its head, like it's a conic projection. Um, what I want to do is pick uh, the WGS 84 
um, projection, or we can filter um, using the EPSG code 4326, um, which mine already is showing. Um, so I'm going to pick that one. This is the uh, coordinate reference system for latitude and longitude. So this is unprojected, it's geographic coordinate system, but we have to specify what our coordinate system is in. Not what we want it to be, that's a different process. We have to tell it what our data came as. Um, so again, picking WGS84 EPSG code 4326. I'm going to click OK to set that. Finally, um, down here at the bottom, if my screen was bigger. You can probably make yours bigger. I'm being limited by my Zoom uh, space here, but um, it'll give you a preview of your table. So here's a good chance to look and see if you've got character encoding issues or you pick the wrong delimiter. If you pick the wrong delimiter, often you just get one um, one column and it is sloppy and makes no sense. There's a bunch of stuff in there. It's all squashed together. Um, that's a good indication you got the wrong delimiter. Um, and again, if I see like a bunch of little squares or question marks in there, um, that's probably means I got the wrong delimiter or sorry, the wrong encoding. Um, but this looks good. Um, I'm Excuse not seeing anything me, funny. Michelle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat and you may have addressed it because yeah. I stepped away for a sec, but that's okay. someone asked, do the encoding and transformation need to be the same for all of the shape files? No, that's a good question. They do not need to be the same for all the shape files, but you do have to you do have to specify it for them. Um, so if if they were different, um, you would want to load them one at a time. So ours were the same, so we could load them all together and use the same parameters. But if, for example, one of them was different, had different encoding, I would load that separately and specify the encoding that way. That's a really good question. All right, so I think we're good to go on our delimited file um, here. I'm gonna go ahead and click add. And then we will see, this is a big file, so it might take a minute to load. Um, oh, it's gonna ask about what accuracy to use. Again, I'm just gonna pick the first one because four meters accuracy is fine for what we're doing. Um, again, if this is for research, pick the one that's appropriate for your area and your, um, your needs for what you're doing. Um, okay, so I think that is, and mine's still loading because I've got the little blue circle, so we'll give that a second. Yours may also take a, a minute or two. There's a lot of trees in that data set, so it sometimes takes a minute to, to load. Um, okay, so that's done. I'm going to close this window now, the um, data source manager, because we don't need it anymore. I've loaded all of our data. Okay, so, oh my goodness, I've got a bunch of pink dots. <laughs> yours, yours will be a different color probably because QGIS kind of picks colors at random. So if yours is a completely different color, don't stress, that's normal. All right, so next thing I want to do, one of the more important things aside from loading data is saving your data set <laughs> or your project. So one way to do that is to click on this blue floppy disk icon up at the top of your um, toolbar, or you can go to project and save or control s it's probably another way to do it too um, so all i'm going to do is um, navigate to where i want to save my data set or where, where i want to save my file again qgis is going to be a little slow um so we're going to give that a second excuse me michelle while we're yeah. waiting uh, i see a hand up in the chat from jeremy prim yeah jeremy do you want to or you put a question in the chat too either way um yes i saw that it said got a message i got a message that said i was just trying to confirm that the y field would be the latitude yes okay thank you yeah so everyone has their own way to remember that but i think of y as latitude like you're climbing a ladder so it's going up <laughs> Almost all GIS people have a post-it note somewhere too with X and Y and latitude and longitude. So don't don't worry if you can't remember those things. We have to look those up. Um, Some of us do magic hand waving. I yes. move my hand along. <laughs> this well, you saw me just do this. So yeah. <laughs> this is normal. I, I promise. All right. So I'm going to navigate to where I want to save my project. I'm just going to put it in the same place where I've got my, my data set for this. You can do your file management however you like. Um, that's a whole, again, a whole nother workshop, but I'm just going to put mine with my, my QGIS stuff. All right. All right. So I'm going to call it, um, what did I say I was going to call it in the workshop? 
I don't think I gave you a name for it. So call it what you want. Um, I would recommend naming it something that later on you'll remember like, oh, that was the QGIS workshop. So I'm just going to call it QGIS underscore workshop. That'll be fine. Um, and notice it's going to save a QGZ file. For those of you who are used to the Esri environment, um, QGZ is really similar to an MXD file. It's going to save all of the styling and the pointers to all of your data um, so that you can open it later and not have to keep reloading everything at the same time. All right, so I'm going to save this. Um, so I told it where I wanted it to go and I gave it a name. And now you can see it's got a name up here at the top of the window. Um, so we'll only have to do that once. Otherwise, we'll just click the Save button. Um, my general rule is save the second you think I ought to save. Like, hmm, maybe I should save this. Click the button now. Don't wait, because sometimes, um, even though QGIS is really stable, it can crash. <laughs> so save. Um, it's also, you don't want to get to the end and forget to save it and close it and then not save your work. OK, so we're going to start by working with raster data. Um, and so what I want to do is I'm going to come over here to my layers panel over on the side. I'm going to, if I hover over this sort of divider area and click and drag, I can make this a little bit bigger so I can see everything. Um, I'm going to turn off all of the layers here, except I'm going to leave the DEM turned on. So I'm going to uncheck everything else because um, we're just going to work with this DEM for right now. OK, so again, when we loaded it, we noted like it kind of looks like San Francisco, but not quite. So what I want to do is play with the styling on this DEM um, so that it starts to look a little bit more intuitive. And again, DEM stands for Digital Elevation Model. So our grid here, this is a raster. It's a, made up of a whole bunch of little pixels. Um, each of those has elevation. So if I zoom in, if I use my zoom tools up here, if I click on this magnifying glass and I draw a little box and I zoom in, this is, I picked a not so good spot, but you can kind of start to see if you do this on your own computer, you'll see little boxes like here's one. Um, so these are in fact pixels. If I right click on it, I can click zoom to layer and zoom back out all the way. Turn on my little hand uh, panning tool here instead. Um, so again, it's a grid and each of those grid cells contains an elevation number. Um, so first thing I want to do if I want to style this is I'm going to open up my layer styling panel. The easiest way to do that is find a blank space in your toolbar up here and right click. Don't click on a tool, click on a blank space. Um, so I'm right clicking and what I want to do is turn on my layer styling panel. Um, so that happens to be right here in my options, so kind of about a third of the way down. So again, turn on layer styling panel. I'm going to check that checkbox. And then it's going to open up something like this. Um, make sure that you've selected your DEM over here in your layer panel, or you can use this drop down menu and select it there. But that way we're working with the raster data set, the DEM. All right. So, um, oh, just looking at my Michelle, notes. quick question. Yeah. Where would I click? You said click on the white space. Yeah. So in this gray, any place like on mine, you can see there's like this blank space over here on the right hand side where I'm kind of moving my cursor. Uh -huh. uh, so I'd click somewhere on that blank space. Um, you can also probably get to it um, in the view menu. Go to panels and then select layer styling panel. So view menu, panels option, and then click layer styling panel there. Thank you. Yeah, it's probably better if I show you with the menus instead of the shortcuts, but you should see all of it. So, okay, so, um, okay, we've got our layer styling panel loaded. We made sure we've selected our DEM. Okay, so now we're going to make some choices. Um, let's see. So, in our symbology tab, so there, these are little tabs here on the side. We're not going to work with the rest of them, but this symbology one is the one we want to work with. Um, normally, when it's not on Zoom and the dimensions aren't weird, it looks like a little paintbrush painting a rainbow. Um, so what we want to do is um, we want to pick our render type. Um, so here where it's a single band gray, I'm going to click on this drop down menu. Again, the little arrow next to single band gray. Um, and we are going to pick, instead of single band gray, we want to pick single band pseudo color, um, which sounds super fancy. Um, but basically, it's going to let us pick colors. Um, now, my data disappeared. We didn't delete anything. It just doesn't know how to style it yet. So it 
it's not showing up but once we make some more selections it'll come back so don't don't panic we didn't delete anything it's just not showing it okay so and then we're going to expand our min max value settings menu right here so if you click on the little arrow it'll open up this menu um okay so for our um the statistics extent so right here where it says statistics extent right now um, we've selected a whole raster um, we want to make sure that is selected you have a couple options but whole raster is the thing we want um, because we have a fairly small data set if you have a really large data set um, you can pick the option to just show the extent um, that you're looking at or some other options to pare down the data so you're not looking at trying to work on with everything if it's loading slowly and then for the accuracy option right now it's doing an estimate this is a really good option again if you have a big data set but we actually want it to use actual slower um, because we have a small data set and if we have it sample we're actually going to miss some data um, because it's probably not going to be represented in our sample so you have options if it's a really big data set by all means let it just sample um, it'll be fine but because we have a smaller data set i want to use all of the values um, okay, so for our color ramp, that was our next thing on the list. Um, let's see. I'm just making it looks like things are in a different order than they used to be. That's okay. Um, so for our color ramp, I'm, I'm going to pick the drop down menu here. Um, and I think I want to pick create new color ramp um, this is gonna we're not necessarily gonna have to make a new color ramp but it's gonna give us some more options so again um, looking at the menu for the color ramp I'm gonna create new color ramp now from our options it's gonna ask us do we want gradient um, it's gonna take it a second to load it's going to have a whole bunch of different options once it's gonna let me open up the drop down menu sorry QGIS and zoom are having a spat at the moment um, but when we can, yours probably will open quicker than mine. Um, when it does open, there's going to be an option for, here we go, catalog uh, CPT-city. Um, this is a, this catalog is a whole bunch of data sets, or not data sets, color ramps um, that we can pick from that have already been made for us. And um, there's some really good topography ones in here. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK and let this load. Um, now it's going to, we can look at all of them. Or we can look at different categories of them. It just picked one at random <laughs> to display my data. Um, San Francisco is now green. Um, so we can look at all the ramps, but I'm going to look at just the topography ones over here um, just because it makes it a little bit easier to find what I'm looking for. And in this case, I want to pick this data, or sorry, this color ramp uh, called CD A. Um, this is a data, or why do I keep saying data set? It's a color ramp. It's a color ramp that's intended to display. Um, elevation data so um, it's really good for um, in this case we go from a ramp from blue so zero in this case we have a we have water we're going all the way down to zero so um, we've got blue all the way up through um, snow-capped mountains which is not typically the case in San Francisco but it's going to help our brains interpret um, so I'm going to pick again uh, from the topography um, color ramps, I'm going to pick CD-A. Feel free to pick whichever one you like. Um, again, for today, because we have uh, an ocean data set, um, I want the one with the blue at the end just because it's going to make the ocean better to understand. So once I pick that one, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Um, and it will change my color ramp here in a second. It's thinking about it. Yours has probably changed already. There we go. Today's uh, workshop is a lesson in patience, apparently, uh, which I am not good at. Okay, so um, all right, so we've added our color ramp. Um, you can see it's. I told you I wanted blue, and now we have the entire thing is blue. But we're going to make some changes. But we can see that our color ramp is previewing that it's our CDA uh, color ramp here. It goes from blue all the way up through white. We're going to make a couple more changes to this so that it will start actually looking like topography. 
Um, so in our interpolation, no wait, what am I looking at? Layer styling panel, yeah, for interpolation, right now it's set to linear, so it's basically going from the from end to end and it's interpolating between those two colors. Um, what I want to do is pick discrete because this will let me chunk up my uh, colors into bins. Um, and then we can assign uh, the range for each of those bins. So you can think of it as kind of like a histogram. Um, and that'll um, help us view these colors a little bit better. Um, and then for the mode down here at the bottom, um, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, right now, the mode is set to uh, continuous, but we want to pick equal interval. Um, and again, this display is kind of just doing whatever it wants. We're going to adjust this in a second. And then the number of classes is set to five. I'm going to tell it I want 10 classes. And you can play with this. You can decide you want more classes or less classes. Um, but that is, that's up to you. Um, I've, for this workshop, this seemed to be a good um, approximation of what we want to see. Okay, so now it kind of, it did equal interval. It made, um, it took the min and the max and divided it up into 10 classes, but we're actually going to tweak these a little bit just for understanding purposes. Um, if we actually double click in um, this value table here, it will, sorry, I just scrolled on accident. Um, if I double click here on value, it tells us the break that it chose was about 1.56. But what I actually wanted to do is break on zero. So everything below zero up to zero is now going to be blue. Yay, it already looks more like the city of San Francisco. <laughs> um, so there are some values in this data set that are less than zero, but I'm just going to tell it anything that is zero and below is going to be colored blue. In my brain, because I associate blue with water, and most of you do too, um, I already can understand this data set better because of this choice. From here on out, uh, this is just kind of monkeying with it and making sure that it's you know, what we want it to be um, visually. But um, I put in your workshop materials the breaks that I chose, so you can feel free to grab those and look at that list. I'll do them right now. Um, but no guarantees I won't get it mixed up because I'm pretty good at that. Um, so our first break again is zero. If I double click on my um, second uh, break here, um, I'm gonna set it to 50. So that kind of greeny color is gonna be 50. Uh, the next one I'm gonna do is 75. Again, this is for visual purposes. Um, if you were doing, uh, you might pick other choices for research purposes. Um, but if you were making a map, you need somebody to clearly understand this is a nice way to do it. Um, so the next one is 175. And again, if you're missing some of these numbers, go ahead and look at um, the workshop materials. They're all listed out for you. And again, you're not being graded on this. So if you want to pick other breaks or you only want to do two of these and you're like, hey, that's enough, I get it, that's fine. Um, that's the beauty of workshops, no grades. Nobody's even going to check on you. So if you picked a whole different color ramp too, great. Feel free to play with it. Okay, and then our very last one, if I did this right, hey, it's probably the only workshop I've done this right on the first try. Um, the last one should be set to INF, which is short for infinity. So it's everything bigger than our last break of 350. Okay, so look, we can now see um, that we have uh, water. You can actually see some of the like docks and low lying areas around the city. Um, and then you can also see some of the topography, like the mountains here um, and some of the more raised up areas. So if you've been to San Francisco um, and you're familiar with the topography, um, this will make a little bit of sense to you. And if, if you haven't, um, you haven't experienced this, um, basically this tells you that there's a hill in the middle of San Francisco. Um, okay, so this is styling for raster data. There's a lot more stuff you can do with raster data that we are not even going to touch. Um, but this just gives you an idea of how to work with it. It hopefully will give you a sense of um, how this data kind of works a little bit. Um, again, you can do a lot more with this. I am going to save my project right now because I just thought about saving. So I would encourage you to click the save button as well. Especially since, again, we're running Zoom and QGIS at the same time, you'll want to, you know, make sure you save your data in case something crashes. Okay, 
Um, so any questions about raster uh, data styling at this moment? I can see stuff is going on in the chat, but I th think uh, Naomi can probably let me know if there's anything that I should talk about now. No, we just had some file management questions. Everything is good. Great. Yeah, file management is hard, um, especially the more data you get. <laughs> um, OK, great. So again, this was uh, a DEM or raster data specifically with elevations. Um, we're going to leave the raster stuff for now, and we're going to switch over to working with vector data. Um, and then later on, we'll come back to this. We can make a map with all of it. But um, we're going to switch over to working with our vector data, so points, lines, and polygons. Um, just checking my notes to make sure I am starting in the right place. OK, so what we're going to do is first we're going to turn off our DEM. We're not deleting it. It's just going to go to sleep. It's going to turn off um, when QGIS is responding for me. Again, normally this only behaves this way because I have zoom on. Normally it's pretty snappy. It doesn't have this much challenge. It's just because I'm trying to use my graphics card for two different things and it's not liking it. Um, OK, so turning off my DM and I'm going to turn on my street center lines um, and QGIS has selected a lovely shade of salmon for me. Um, <laughs> yours is probably some other color. Um, you can see in the workshop materials probably um, at some point, I think I have uh, screenshots of this. It probably picked a completely different color when I screenshotted it. Um, it's just picking random. This is why we don't want to leave the defaults, because the default is just literally randomly selected. One time I loaded up some data and everything was shades of hot pink. And I was like, wow, I need to fix that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to work with our um, street center lines, and I'm going to make sure it's selected here in my layers uh, list. And you'll notice that my layer styling panel changed as well. So now I have options that pertain specifically to vector data, and in this case, lines with vector data. OK, so um, we are going to leave our drop down menu up here for single symbol. There are a lot of other options. We'll see some of those later on. Um, let's see, so in in this box down here, just slightly under our drop down menu for our type of data um, symbology, um, we have this box that has line, and then we have simple line. These two options have different properties associated with them, and they help you style lines. The reason that we have this is because we can actually stack up a whole bunch of different lines. Um, and say I needed to have a, a map, and I wanted to have my street be very wide and maybe a gray color, and I wanted a dashed yellow line down the middle of it to um, simulate a, a street, um, I could do that by stacking up lines. I could have a, a wider gray line and then a thinner dashed yellow line in the middle, for example. Um, I'm not sure when I would need that, but it's, uh, I think, an example you can imagine doing. Um, we're only going to have one line here, but I'm going to select our simple line, um, and we're going to work with these parameters because they get a little bit more specific. OK, so in the box for the color, if I click on the color itself, mine is sort of this orangey salmon-y color. Yours might be something else. It probably is. We have a whole bunch of different options. So it gives me a list of recent colors. So it remembered that I've been working with these other colors at some point um, in recent history. Um, if you're, if this is your first time opening QGIS, you might not have colors there, or they might just be random. Um, you have this color wheel. So if you want to work with a color wheel, you can work with that. There's also this um, other option for picking colors with, um, you know, chroma arranged a different way. Um, and then all of them have this hue, saturation, and value um, RGB options down here at the bottom as well. Um, I use a combination of these things when I'm picking colors. Um, I'll also pick colors like I will um, use hex codes and things like that as well. There's no one set way to pick colors. Um, you can use a combination of things. Um, in this case, I gave you a hex code for um, your color options. So if I scroll down on any of these um, 
color selection panels, you'll notice this HTML notation. This is where I can put in um, a hex notation for a color. In this case, if you put in, um, it turns out to be six sixes, you'll get the same gray color that I have in the workshop materials. And if I hit enter, it will change it. So instead of having my orangey salmon color, now my roads are uh, this dark gray. And honestly, when I'm doing cartography, I tend to get very literal with my color decisions because um, it gives my viewer sort of an intuition. If I'm working with what they expect, like water is blue, roads are gray or black, um, then I don't have to explain as much. If I make all my roads purple, they're going to be like, what's the purple lines? But if I make them dark gray, they're like, that's probably a road. And then I don't have to put as much in my legend. Um, oh, so somebody has a question about um, your DM is invisible. Um, there's a really cool option if you go into, if you look at your layers list, I'm going to show you with my street center lines, but it should work with your DEM as well. If I right click on the name of my layer and choose the option zoom to layer, that's probably going to bring your DEM back or whatever layer is gone far away. Um, in this case, it zooms in and fills up my screen so I can see things a little bit better. Um, so that might be the option if you accidentally slid it over to the side you can find it again okay so um, we've made our roads uh, dark gray by using this uh, html notation and i gave you the color that i used before but we could pick it off the list um, we could do um, we could make our own version of gray we could make it purple we could make it green whatever makes you happy but again when i'm doing cartography i tend to go fairly literal um, i kind of like little kids who insist trees have brown trunks and green leaves. <laughs> it just, it helps with perception. Um, okay, so I made my color selection. I'm going to click this back button to go back to my interface here. Um, we can change things like, um, so in terms of like graphic design, stroke refers to either the outline of a polygon or a line itself. So you can think of it as like the outline. So if you see that stroke means the line. Um, fill, when we work with polygons, fill means the inside color. Um, so just so you, you've seen that before. Okay, but so we've done some basic styling. Um, this already makes me happier because in my mind, again, roads are grays and blacks typically, um, not orange. Um, so that that kind of helps my brain a little bit. Um, what I wanna do next is show you your attribute table. So each of these lines, is not just a line, a pretty picture that shows up on a map, um, which is in itself really cool, but each of these lines has information about the line itself. So if I, again, if I click on my street center lines um, and I right click again, um, just like we did before, but now I'm gonna select open attribute table, which is kind of in the middle of the options. And it's gonna open up a table of information that we have stored in our data set. Each row of data that's going to show up in my table eventually is linked to a line in my data set. So um, it will tell us things like, what is the name of that line segment? What um, In this case, this uh, data set has things like the neighborhood name. So I could find all the roads in a particular neighborhood. Um, it also has, um, oh goodness, so here's the N, N hood is neighborhood. Um, so that tells you what neighborhood the road is in. Um, it tells you the street type. Is it a street? Is it an avenue? Is it a court? Um, we've got street name, um, all kinds of information. Some of it, um, zip code, that's easy to understand. Some of this stuff is stuff that the city of San Francisco uses in their database that um, is not super intuitive to us, but we can just ignore that stuff that we don't need. Um, but if I pick one of these roads, if I click on its row number, um, what will happen is, and this will be probably really hard to see, um, it will be highlighted in the map itself. So if I click on one of these buttons here, um, this one looks like a little um, magnifying glass over a yellow box. Um, what that does is it's going to zoom to my selection. So when I highlighted this row, I selected it. Um, and yellow on white is really hard to see, but um, maybe if I pop the shoreline on in the background. That was a bad choice. I angered my graphics card. Um, but there's a yellow line that goes across here that is that line that I just selected in my attribute table. Um, 
sorry, QJS needs a moment to gather itself apparently. Um, but so the point of this is that each of those uh, rows in my attribute table is related to an actual object on our map. And so we can do things like select things based on their attributes. Um, what I'm gonna do is um, zoom back out. So I'm going to, I'm gonna turn off our shoreline again. It didn't help like I thought it would. Um, and I'm just gonna zoom to layer. So again, I'm gonna right click and select zoom to layer to zoom back out. Um, we can also, we can select things in other ways, which I won't get into at this moment, but um, Basically what I want you to see is that what you see on the map is linked to a data table. So not only do we have shapes and location, but we also have information about each of those pieces of information. And that's the power of GIS. Um, not only can we stack things up in space, but we can have information about each of those locations. And so actually what we've built right now is a database. So if you're scared of databases, we just did it and you didn't even know. So. Um, don't be scared of them anymore because we've built a spatial database now for the city of San Francisco, um, which will set you up well for when we teach spatial databases later, um, <laughs> probably in the fall. Um, so I'm going to click save again just because I thought about saving. Um, okay, so we looked at the attribute table and we've kind of seen what's in there. Um, what I want to do now is skip down to the select by attributes um, section of the workshop because I think that's really powerful. Um, so in our attribute table, um, we have this option, which I apologize, these buttons are super small with Zoom, um, but there is this button here right uh, under my little pan tool that looks like a little white glove. Um, it is, it looks like a letter, a script letter E or a sigma on top of a um yellow uh sorry again qjs is having a bit of a fit um on top of a yellow square so i'm looking for this uh sigma button when i hover over it it's going to say select features using an expression all right so i'm clicking that and that opens up this box um we're going to build the expression here in this blank spot on the left side, and then we've got some helper things over on uh, the rest of our window. Um, one of my favorite things is this list and sort of in the middle of fields and values. This is your list of columns from your attribute table, which makes me so happy because then I don't have to remember how to spell things or like all the weird like, you know, is it an underscore? Is it camel case? It's just there and ready for me so I can double click and get the right spelling and um, capitalization and all that. All right, so um, we are going to specifically, I wanna write a query to look at our um, class code uh, column. So class code in this data set um, is the type of road. Um, all of our roads have been classified into different class codes. And what we want to do is figure out what these are. So I'm going to double click on my fields and values list where it says class code. And it's going to automatically put class code with the right syntax into my uh, expression box here. And the double quotes means that it we're looking at a column. Single quotes means text. Do I ever remember that? No. That's why I like this thing where I can double click and then it does it for me because when I try, think I know, I always forget and then I have to end up switching it. This is quicker. Um, and then also I know that this is spelled properly. Okay, so I've got class code. I'm saying, hey, QGIS, let's go look at the class code column. And now I need to tell it what I want it to do with that. Um, with class code, I can get, um, because I'm familiar with this data set, I know there's only a few class codes. So I'm gonna ask it to give me all the unique values. So it's gonna give me zero through six. I would not do this on a continuous data set. I might have it give me 10 samples if I needed to kind of see what the format was, but I know that this class code, there's only a handful of them. Okay, so let's say I wanted to find out like, okay, I've got zero through six for my categories. So I'm gonna say, hey, QGIS, give me all my class codes that equal Let's in this case pick one. Um, and again, it gave me one and it put it in single quotes because that for some reason this is a text field. That's fine. Um, this version of QGIS and going back a year or so, um, it can handle knowing that if I just type in a one, it doesn't need to be in quotes, it'll kind of convert for me. Um, so I'm going to tell it select features and I'm going to see what happens on my map. 
Okay, so on my map, if I move some of this stuff out of the way, um, you can see it highlighted everything, all of the roads that had class code as one in the attribute table. That's pretty cool. I didn't have to go through and select them all by hand. <laughs> I could just say, hey, QGIS, give me all my class code equals one roads. So we might make a guess what class code equals one means. I'm going to guess, since I'm familiar with the highways in uh, Northern California, that this is probably highways or freeways or something like that. Um, OK, cool. So we've made some, some guesses about our, um, our data set. Now we could also, if we wanted to change this and we want to look at two, we can fix that and change it to two and then say select features and we can find out what class code two is. Okay, class code two looks like maybe major roads, something like that. I can make guesses about this data set. Um, the good news is that this data set actually is very well documented and it comes with something called metadata, which is a description about the data. And so we actually know what the class code means and I put it in your workshop materials so you don't actually have to guess. So um in this case one was freeways two was highways three is major streets etc so we can actually um because it is documented we don't have to actually guess we can the city of san francisco did a really good job with this data set and gave us that information but if we had to guess we could um, because of the way that this is set up um, so the point of this section is really to show you one you can query for things you don't have to make selections by hand um, and two, that really the data is linked, not only the um, do we have tabular data, but we also have spatial data and they're linked up in a way that's really powerful and helpful for us as researchers. Okay, so that's attribute querying. You just did a database query. Um, I just want to point that out. Um, this is a a form of syntax. It's really similar to um, some of the things we do with SQL. So um, I'm just going to point that out for those of you who might be a little bit like database or programming phobic. Um, you're kind of getting your toes wet and it's it's OK. <laughs> um, it wasn't too painful. Um, OK, so that's attribute querying. Um, what I want to do now is I'm going to go ahead and close our um, select by expression dialog. Um, and then in the attribute table, I'm going to click this button that um, is called de deselect all features from the layer. Um, it looks like a little red no smoking sign on a yellow box, um, which makes some people think it's going to delete data, but it doesn't. It just unselects it. Um, but it's good to, to pause and make sure that you're not deleting stuff. In this case, we're not deleting it. That's what the trash can icon does. Okay. Any questions about that so far? I'm going to kind of go fairly quick through um, the next section so that we can get through a little bit more material before the end. <clears throat> All right. Not seeing any questions, and I'm glad the zoom to layer thing worked. That's what I learned about that in, in GIS in general. Um, made my life so much better because then I could find the data when I accidentally scrolled away from it. Um, Okay, so uh, symbolizing layers by attributes. Okay, so we just did a whole selection process and you could think like, well, okay, I can select it and then maybe I could save it out and then have all these different layers. No, you don't need to do that. We can actually do our symbology based on our attribute data. How cool is that? Um, it makes life a lot easier because we can just tell QGIS, hey, look at this column and do my styling based on the column. Um, Okay, so we've already deselected our features, which is the first part of the next section. I'm gonna go ahead and close our attribute table just because we don't need to look at that at the moment. Okay, so we're still working with our street center lines. And now instead of classifying with single symbol, um, I see QJS doesn't like when I navigate away from it. Um, I clicked over on something in Zoom and now it's having trouble coming back. I think that makes sense. Okay, so um, right now we've got single symbol because we just made all the roads uh, gray. But instead, if I click on that um, drop down menu, I can tell it that I want to do, I think we want to do uh, rule based categorize. That's what we want to do. Um, we'll do rule based later. Okay, so we've, we're going to categorize our roads. And again, our roads disappear just because it doesn't know how to symbolize it yet, but it'll come back. Um, for our value drop down menu, so for value here, I am going to pick class code. We've, we understand our class code now. We know what that is all about. Um, our symbol is going to be a line. That's fine. 
um, color ramp, random colors, that's okay too for now. And what I want to do now is pick classify. What that's going to do is it's going to look at our class code uh, values and it's going to make a option for each of those. Okay, party colors. <laughs> um, it's going to pick them at random uh, because I chose random colors. There's other options. Um, how do you get to your layer styling panel again? Um, you can go to, I think it's your view menu, uh, go to panels and pick layer styling to get your layer styling panel back. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so again, if you also, if you need to catch up on some of the parameters, they're all in your workshop materials as well. Okay, so we've got our class code for the value um, and we click classify, so it put value zero through six and then it has this all other class two we can uncheck that because they're all um they're all categorized i believe okay so um it did what we asked and if we we're making a map to like a children's birthday party this might be good but um we're probably not doing that here so um then we can make some other choices based on how we want to communicate. So the process of doing um, symbology or cartography is all about communicating um, and communicating effectively and efficiently. So again, I'm going to make choices based on things that um, our human brains are going to understand quickly without having to look up uh, a bunch of different things in the um, key or the legend. Um, okay. So again, not our best choice if we're trying to communicate roads and different types of roads. This is hard to read, even if it um, wasn't party colors. And again, your party colors will be different than mine just because it's picking them at random. Okay, so um, just looking at my notes. Um, so instead of having all of these colors, what I would like to do is, since we think of different types of roads as being different sizes, like freeways are typically larger than residential streets um, in terms of width and also traffic volume and stuff like that. So in my mind, they're just bigger. So what I would like to do is instead of varying my symbology based on color, I want to change my symbols to be different widths. So every line will be the same color, but there'll be a different width depending on what kind of road it is. So what I actually want to do is I'm going to change all these to be the same color to start. <laughs> so I'm going to click on my first row, I'm going to hold down shift and click on my last row. I'm going to highlight everything. And then I'm going to right click and tell it I want to change the color. Now this sounds really unintuitive, like I categorize them and I'm going to make them the same color, but it will make sense when we start changing the widths. Um, so again, we can pick the color that we want, like I could make them all green, I could make them all blue, um, but what I actually want to do is I'm going to make them the same color gray. Um, <clears throat> in the workshop materials I have, I picked out a different gray color, it's alternating A's and zeros. So you do A zero three times. And that's sort of a lighter gray. Um, this will be a nice background color to work with. Um, so, okay, every every line is gray right now. I'm going to click um, on my list. Uh, and our legend, um, we can actually, it defaults to the legend value of what is in the attribute table. We can actually change these to be human readable. If I double click on legend, I can say zero is private streets. And for example, one is freeways, which we already discovered. So um, again, your workshop materials has a table of these um, for uh, your reference. So three is major streets. Four is going to be secondary streets. If you think typing is hard normally, try to type and talk at the same time. Okay, five is local streets. So these are categories actually coming from the city of San Francisco. And then six is freeway ramps. 
Okay, so we haven't changed anything in terms of the symbology, but we've changed the names. And actually, if we come over to our layers list and we expand our street center lines, we'll see that actually, as we've been typing, it's been updating over here as well. Um, so now this is just going to be easier to read if we make a legend. Um, so that's a good start. Um, and now the next thing we want to do is actually change the line width for these. So um, I'm going to tell you the default for the width on these is 0.26. So we can skip. Uh, private streets, and I'm going to just start with uh, the freeways number uh, one here. If I double click on my symbol, I can change the width here. I'm gonna change it, um, in this case, I think I want I want points for my units. Um, so that's points in terms of like font points. Like, um, so, you know, you're used to thinking in terms of points in terms of font, so that gives you an idea. So I'm gonna do 2.0 for my freeways. You can see immediately that my freeways now have become much wider and already that starts to make a little bit more sense in my brain since I'm familiar with the freeways. Same thing with highways. In my head, a highway and a freeway are pretty similar, so I'm just going to make them the same width. They're all going to be two. Um, it's a little probably wider. I'm guessing that this is a double line, um, like two lines next to each other. It's a divided highway, so that's why these look so fat, but we'll just go ahead and go with it for now. So I'm going to click the back button and then Oh, you know what it is? I had millimeters. Let's change uh, highways to points. That will be better. There we go. Um, and then for major streets, we're going to change the width to one. Oops, not 12, one. And points. So you can see those got a little bit wider um, than the default. Um, secondary streets and local streets, again, we're going to leave with the default. And then uh, for number six, the freeway ramps, those are going to be 0.5. So I'm going to make the units points, and we're going to do 0.5. Okay. And again, you don't have to do all of these, um, you know, for the workshop, just get an idea of how this works, and that's sufficient. But um, so now we can see immediately that this is a little bit more understandable. We've got minor roads kind of in the middle and then um, scattered throughout. We've got these thicker roads, which immediately would probably tip off a of viewer that these are larger roads for some reason. They would probably guess, oh, these are probably freeways. Um, so we're using what, you know, our human intuition is and we're um, using that to communicate um, and in this case, instead of categorizing by color, we're categorizing by line width. Um, so that can help with uh, communication and cartography. So um, we're going to go ahead and click save because we just did a lot of work and we'd like to keep that. Okay, so how cool was that? All of this, again, this is underlying. Uh, the reason we can do this is because we have this data that um, is attached to all of these shapes. All right, so the question is your legend doesn't have uh, the um, descriptions. We entered those by hand. So if I double click on, um, for example, where it says private streets, I actually typed in private streets there. The default would just be to say zero. So you're going to change those by hand. OK, so are we ready to jump into rule-based symbology? Um, this is another way we're going to combine the concept of uh, the query that we did earlier where we said, hey, QGIS, show me the class code one. Um, we can write actually a query and have that run our symbology, which again saves time. I don't have to make selections by hand. I don't have to output all kinds of other data sets. Um, we can just do that with a query. All right. Let me just get on literally on the right page here. Um, okay, so now we're going to start working with our street trees. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my street trees. Um, if your data sets are in a different order, like for example, your trees are um, lower on the list, you can literally click and drag them higher or lower in the list and move them up and down. Um, the way that the layers list works is anything that is higher up is on top. So you can think of it as stacks of paper or stacks of um, like old school um, GIS used to be done on clear sheets of mylar. So you can think of it as stacking your mylar in a certain order, mylar being like clear plastic. Um, so I'm going to turn on my street trees. 
this is a big data set, so it might take a second to load. And I kind of think it looks like a pile of ants <laughs> since loading up and they're kind of moving around. Um, so each of these points, despite the fact that mine are currently pink, represent trees. Um, so to make my brain happier, I might turn these green. But for now, I'm going to not bother with that and leave them pink. Um, yours might be or probably are a different color, and that's fine. Um, we will work with that later. So. What I want to do is be able to query my data set and find the trees that are of a particular type. So remember in our street tree data set when we loaded it, you might have noticed there's a column in our data set that tells me what species each of these points is. Um, and in this case, um, we've set up a scenario where we want to find the canary pines uh, that are in the city of San Francisco, um, thinking about um, you know what trees might be vulnerable to certain pests so we want to find the canary pines because maybe we want to start some sort of monitoring program that's the idea in this uh, section of the workshop okay so i have my street trees selected in my layer panel and we've noticed the layer styling panel again has switched over to uh, the street trees and now i have options for points um, we could style them you know, green, we could change the shape, things like that. But what I really want to do is work with rule based styling. I don't want to pick all of the trees. I don't want to do categories based on all of the trees. I only want to show canary pines. So I'm going to pick rule based off this drop down menu. Um, and right now, my rule that it has um, is all of the trees, and you're going to see it's going to load them up pretty soon. Um, so I can have all my trees, but I want to make a specific rule for canary pine. So I'm going to click add rule. It's this green plus button down here. So when I do that, it's going to automatically start editing the new rule. What I want to do is I want to give it a name. So in my legend, I'll be able to know what this particularly is. So I'm going to type canary pine in here. Um, and this doesn't change anything. It's just the, the label, the human readable label we're going to put on it so we can know what that is and not have to interpret the expression. For the filter in this case, what I want to do is I want to click on this uh, E or Sigma button because I want to build a query. And this query box is going to look really familiar because when we queried our attribute table before, we had something similar. Um, sorry, we're, we're not responding for a moment here. Um, so what we want to do once this loads up is we're going to open up our fields and values list again, just like before, to get our column list. And what I'm going to do is pick the column on my list that refers to our species. And as I recall, it's something a little bit uh, funky. I'm looking at the notes here. Um, well, I'll see it when we, oh, it's called Q species. So when we open that up, we're going to look for the column called Q species. Um, and we're going to select that. And then we're going to build our query on that. Again, lesson patience for me today. Um, <laughs> and then what we're going to see is um, that our field here, our column for Q species, has a bunch of different information in it. Here we go. So I'm going to open up um, my field and values list. And again, I'm going to pick Q species. So I'm going to double click that so it puts it in my query. Um, and what I want to do is I'm going to pick 10 samples just so you can see what this column contains and it's probably not going to have canary pine in the list but notice it has the latin name and then a space two colons a space and then a um, common name for the species um, and honestly common name can change quite a bit so um, it would be um, kind of hard to guess unless you knew it was in there um, but also i i think it's quite a bit easier to make sure we get the right species if we use the Latin name because that doesn't vary. Um, but we'll have to find it in here if we want to go exact. So instead of being exact, what we want to do is use something called a wild card. Um, so what I want to do is before we used equals, um, and that's fine, but for actually text comparisons, we want to use a comparison called the like. Um, and then we're going to uh, use our Latin name. Um, so I'm going to use single quotes. Sometimes I like to put both quotes and then fill in the middle um, just because that way I don't forget to put it at the end. So our Latin name for canary pines is Pinus canariensis. 
Okay, um, and that is in your workshop materials too, um, if you want to just copy and paste it. Um, if I tried to run this right now, it's going to be like, nope, that doesn't match because what I really should have is Pinus canariensis and then two colons and then whatever they've decided the common name is. Um, so instead I can say, hey, QJS, just find the row that has, um, that has this in it and I don't care what else is around it. And the way I do that is use a wild card. So in this case for QGIS, a wild card is percent. So if I put percent before and after, what this tells QGIS is it says, in this column Q species, go find the, the instances where I have the string Pinus canariensis. And if there's stuff on either side of that, I don't really care. So if there's like a space or there's some other text, that's fine. As long as it just says Pinus canariensis somewhere in there, consider that a match. So that's what wildcards do for us. It says, it's kind of like whatever, you know, whatever Pinus canariensis and then whatever, I don't care. Um, so that will match all of our canary pines. So I'm going to click OK. Um, and if this doesn't work, I'm going to come back and check my spelling of Pinus canariensis. Um, and this will take a minute to load just because there's a lot of trees and um, it's going to have to run through all of them. And also, again, we're all on Zoom right now. So be patient. And it, again, takes a second to load. Um, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to actually get and turn off my... Um, rule for everything because I don't really need to see everything. I just want to make sure that my um, canary pine rule is turned on. I don't know how long I should wait for it. I think I might have spelled something wrong. Oh, they came up. Never mind. <laughs> Again, I just need to be more patient. Um, okay, so we've got um, and now I've clicked back off it, so it's going to load again. Um, so you may be looking at your own distribution on your screen. You can see there's a lot less canary pines than there are all of the trees in San Francisco. So we've got quite a bit, a smaller subset. Um, and they're concentrated in certain areas. Like this street here has a whole bunch of them. And then this one here also has a whole bunch of them. So if I was going to start... Um, like a monitoring program, I would probably focus my efforts on probably on this street just because there's so many of them. But if I needed a second location, I might go here and a third, maybe over here. Um, so you can see that um, by doing this query, we can get a really good idea of the spatial distribution um, right off the bat. Um, all right, so that is a helpful way to um, take a look at doing a uh, rule-based symbology, which can help us do, do things like understand spatial distributions and also um, helping us with a make, making a map. So I'm going to go ahead and click save. Um, I want to show you, we've only got a couple minutes left, um, and I want to show you how to build a map. So I'm going to go really quickly through this. Again, all of the stuff I'm going to cover is in your workshop materials. So um, if you need to come back and take a look at this, um, and fill in some of the gaps because I'm going quickly, then you can. Um, and then also the exercise um, chapter 13, select by location. Um, we're not gonna get to that. I almost never get to that in two hours. So <laughs> um, something to do for homework and it's, it's an exercise in spatial analysis um, and well worth the time to do. It's just um, takes a little bit longer in a workshop uh, setting. So, Okay, so building a map. Um, the way this happens in QGIS is with a print composer. Um, and we can get to that with the project menu. Um, and I'm going to tell it I want a new print layout. And the first thing it's going to say is, what do you want to call this thing? So I'm going to call it Canary Pine. Oh, sorry, we're going to take a second to load. Um, and then when I'm going to give it a name, I'm going to click OK, and then it's going to open up my print composer. The thing to know about the print composer is that it starts out blank. <laughs> you have to tell it everything you want in it, including the, the map itself. All right, so I'm giving it a name. I'm going to say it's Canary Pine. I'm going to click OK, and it's going to load up a new window. Um, if I want to change, so this is my page. If I want to change the page properties, I'm going to right click on my page and click Page Properties. The default is A4 uh, for the page size, but I want to pick a letter. Um, and then I'm going to, I'm going to use landscape, but I could change a portrait if I wanted. Um, and like I was saying, 
you just get a blank page. You have to add anything you want to it. Uh, absolutely everything has to be added. It's not going to assume you want a map um, because you might not. <laughs> um, you add most of the things with the stuff that shows up here on the left hand side on my print composer, your toolbar might be somewhere different. Um, I'm going to add a map with this add map button. I honestly never remember what all the buttons look like. I just use the tooltips. If you hover over it, it'll tell you what it does. So I'm going to click add map. And now I have to tell it where I want the map. Um, I'm going to let it snap to the corner. And then as I click and drag, it's going to make a map the size that I click and drag. And I'm just going to let it snap to the corners for this. And then when I release, it's going to make a map. Um, I don't get too picky about the size because I can always change it with the properties. Everything you add to the print composer has properties, um, including size um, and extent and things like that. So it is fine if it's not perfect. I can always resize it later. OK, so it loaded up my data. This is going to show me whatever is in my print composer. So if I don't like the colors, I have to go change that in my print composer. Um, but right now, because it selected a shade of green for my trees, I'm fine with that for now. Um, if I was doing this for a project, I would definitely be a little more picky. Um, one important thing to note is this move item content button. So if I click on that, it's going to let me, if I click and drag, I'm actually going to move the content of the map. It's like panning and zooming in the regular map. So clicking and dragging. And I'm just going to drag it so that the city of San Francisco is kind of sitting on the bottom of the map um, because that's where the streets end. Um, I could do something like if I go back to my QGIS uh, window, I could turn on my DEM. It's going to think about it for a second. Um, so I want to add things as well, um, not just like the DEM and the spatial information, but I also want to add in things like a title. Um, we can add a legend in the print composer. It's just having a little QGIS party. Um, <laughs> it's doing its own thing. So I just click the reload button because I think it loaded the DEM um, in QGIS. And if I reload it, it should show up in the print composer in a moment. Preview, yeah, it's in there. Um, but I could also do things like I could change the background layer um, color and things like that. We'll wait for this to load. Okay, so there's our DEM, and you can see the roads are on top of that. Um, if I wanted to, I could add a label. So that's how you can add a title, for example. Um, if I click that, normally when I add titles, I'll just put them anywhere and whatever size it's like, hey, do you want it this size? I could mess with this, but honestly, I'm just going to tell it okay and I'll resize it later. Um, so you don't type directly in the box, you have to type in label properties. So I'm going to call this map Canary Pines, and you might be able to see it's updating in real time, but the font's really small. So um, for the font, I'm going to click on font, and I'm going to pick something bigger. Like if I pick 72, that's very large, and print 72 points is one inch, um, which is helpful to know. So I might back off of that a bit. Let's try 60. It's going to think about that. Um, but also what I can do is I can resize my box as well um, for how big this is because it, it doesn't need to be this big. So if I hover over the handles, I can drag and make it smaller. And then because I have the selector tool selected, I can drag and move this and maybe put this at the top. Um, we have a whole workshop on making um, uh, maps for journal figures. Um, so feel free to find that on the data lab site, or if you can't find it, let me know. Um, and I can point you to that. Um, but other things you might want to know about are things like adding legends. There's north arrows and things like that that you can add to your print composer. Um, but we are just at four o'clock. So what I would encourage you to do, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all. Um, what I would encourage you to do is we have the print materials for this workshop live online. They do not leave. Um, so you can feel free to refer back to those um, and follow up on anything else in the workshop maybe that you missed or things that you want to go into more depth on that we didn't have a chance to go into. Um, and again, for those of you who are UC Davis affiliates, feel free to come see me in office hours and we can talk more about this um, and more of the capabilities. And again, we'll post the video for this um, 
version of the workshop on our YouTube channel coming up soon. So thank you all for joining me today. I hope you learned some things. I hope that you um, have learned to love QGIS at least a fraction of the amount that I do. Um, so again, thank you very much.